Good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started with tonight's program. Welcome to uh, In the Adirondack Library. I am Joe Dolan, Public Programs Assistant here at the Adirondack Experience Museum on Blue Mountain Lake. Um, the Adirondack Experience Library is the largest, uh, most comprehensive repository of books, manuscripts, maps, and government documents relating to the history of the Adirondacks. And throughout this series, we are excited to bring you inside the library at least virtually, um, exploring Adirondack life, history, and culture. The books in this series are all available on our online store and at your local public library. I hope you will all continue to join us through the rest of the winter and into the spring for this series. All of the information about the books and authors and the schedule is online at theadkx.org. Our interviewer for tonight and throughout this series has been Mitch Tyke. He is the station manager of North Country Public Radio and host of North Words. North Words is the fourth Friday of each month on NCPR with weekly podcast episodes featuring interviews, on-site recordings, and special features, reminding us about what makes the North Country uh, such a special and unique place. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's author, Brian Thompson. He's a lifelong resident of St. Lawrence County he holds a bachelor's from Cornell and a master's from SUNY Geneseo. He has published more than 50 articles on local history in local, regional, and state publications. He was the 2009 winner of the New York State Archives and New York State Regents Bruce W. Deerstein Award for Excellence in Educational Use of Historical Records. He is also the recipient of the State Archives Ackman Research Fellowship. An Association of Public Historians, New York State Registered Public Historian. He is currently the Municipal Historian of the Town of DeKalb. Tonight, Brian will provide a brief overview of his book, Exploring African American Pioneers Who Shaped St. Lawrence County Through Grit and Determination. And then he will answer some questions from Mitch, members of the audience. So we welcome your participation throughout the program. Use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen Click on it and type in your questions at any time, and then we'll get to them later. Um, also, be sure to check the chat for important links from Annabelle. And now I'll turn it over to Brian. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with everybody about my book. We can begin with the PowerPoint presentation. The book is the result of 20 years of, of work and research into local history in the area. If we can go to the next slide. Um, every book I think has to have, a, uh, especially historical books, have to have an important question. And for me, this, this the important question I started with this book was, well, how long have black people actually been living in St. Lawrence County? And as I began to delve into it, I found it was a pretty amazing history. Um, can you go to the next slide? Actually, ever since the first aboriginals or non-aboriginal settlers came to this area, when Abbe Francois Piquet founded Fort La Presentation in what's today Ogdensburg, he came with an enslaved man named Charles as his personal servant. Charles spoke multiple languages and um, he actually accompanied Piquet when he went back to France to visit the court of Louis XV. Uh, and there was also a black woman who was the midwife at Fort La Presentation. And following the departure of Piquet, the priest who succeeded him arrived with his own enslaved servant, Anselme, who, and Anselme stood by his, his owner's side through the Battle of Fort Levi and died in a hospital in Montreal just weeks after the completion of the battle and the surrender of the French to the British. Okay, next. Um, Pierre-Paul-Francois Paul Lagarde was the second priest at the presentation. You see here 
a view of this settlement. It was a very interesting settlement on the river. It, it, there were over 2,000 Native American settlers in the, in, the, in the settlement there, as well as people from throughout Europe. So it was a very, the very first settlement of um, St. Lawrence County was a multinational, multi-ethnic settlement. And there at least six different languages were spoken in the settlement, okay? Um, as we move on from the French following um, their surrender, we enter the period of British North America. There's much more to be discovered about this, um, this time period, as we know that several of the British officers who served at Fort Oswegatchie actually owned enslaved people. Uh, but I want to go on to our first free Black person to be live in the area. Lewis Cook was the son of an African-American man and an Abenaki woman. He was born in the Lake Champlain Valley as a young child when he was about 10, um, a French army unit uh, captured he and his mother and his father, and they were about to sell him into slavery, which is what, as a spoil of war, the troops usually got to sell their hostages. And uh, Cook's mother begged them not to. And so he returned with his mother up in, to Quebec, where he was educated by missionary, Jesuit missionaries, and he became a brilliant linguist. He was, was the only black commissioned officer in George Washington's army, and he was the highest ranking Native American officer in George Washington's army. Before that, he served at, by, beside his French comrades at the Battle on the Plains of Abraham, and he's depicted in the famous painting of that action. He, uh, his first wife was a Mohawk woman. When she passed, he married a woman from the Oneida tribe. He, he lived for a time with the Oneida nation, but in the early 1790s, he was involved with negotiations and moved back to Northern New York and as part of his negotiations, received title to 600 acres where the current village of Messina now is. And he erected a mill and had a farm and other businesses there. He did not like the British at all. So when the War of 1812 broke out, he with some of his sons and other members of the settlement there went to volunteer to serve in the War of 1812. At this point, he was almost 80 years old. Uh, he was at first rejected, and the British sent sort of subtle messages saying, oh, he was a spy. When he got to Fort Niagara, they laughed at him, and they said, no black Native American man could possibly have been an officer. But then he produced his actual original handwritten commission from George Washington. They allowed him to, uh, to follow as, um, as an observer when they crossed over into Upper Canada to wage battle. Um, <clears throat> at following, he, he took part in two battles in the War of 1812, and following that, he fell ill and he died in Buffalo, or outside of Buffalo in a native community He's buried in an unmarked grave, but he's probably one of the highest ranking Revolutionary War soldiers that lived in St. Lawrence County. Next. Now, when we start to think about African-Americans in St. Lawrence County, we have to remember that New York State was a slave owning state. At the time of the American Revolution, there were more slaves in New York state than were, there were in any other state north of the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, uh, most of our early political leaders owned enslaved black people. Uh, 
Nathan, Judge Nathan Ford owned, owned people, and so did uh, Lewis Hasbrook, our first county clerk. And some of the biggest slave owners in the county were the Ogdens of Waddington. You see in this image, there's a bill of sale for a man named Sharp. Sharp was, in, was purchased by Lewis Hasbrook in Ulster County and brought back to Ogdensburg after they sold the enslaved woman Nanny, who they had owned for many years. Uh, Sharp would go on, and after slavery was abolished in 1827 in New York State on the 4th of July, he would go on to live as a free person in Ogdensburg. He married and had three children, uh, a son and two daughters. His two daughters were still living in Ogdensburg in 1850. Go on. Next. Slavery was abolished in 1827. It was illegal to sell a slave out of New York State after 1799 when the gradual abolition um, law was passed. However, that was largely ignored by wealthy people, and the bl Black population of New York State actually declined between 1800 and 1810. Um, Charlotte Ogden was the wife of Governor Ogden, and she wrote in her diary on March 22nd, 1827, Father, meaning Governor, her husband, sold the two Blacks for $200, a pretty good bargain had a very melancholy party. The last of their slaves were illegally sold out of state just four months before they would have been free. So that was especially a melancholy party, parking for these two human beings that were sold back into lifetime chattel. Next. Following the end of slavery in New York State, many black people lived in the area, um, but how most of them, from my research, couldn't gain access to property. The black people in the area usually didn't own property and it seemed their people weren't willing to sell them the property. The few people that did get them property were able to have stay longer in one area. Otherwise people were tended to move a lot. One of the families that did get to purchase property were that of Richard and Lavinia Boston of Messina. Richard Boston had come here as an enslaved man. Um, and um, he, with the Robinson family, and Lavinia Boston uh, was born an enslaved person in Cornwall, Ontario. Her mother's Enslaver left provisions in his will so that her mother um, and her children all were provided with money and sort of an endowment. And that appears to be what allowed our Richard and Lavinia to buy a farm in Messina. And then two of their sons also bought farms in Messina. The two sons both married white women. And the grand, two grandsons of Richard and Lavinia actually went on to serve in white regiments from St. Lawrence County in the Civil War. Okay, next. The, another interesting thing in the abolitionist era, uh, following the end of slavery in St. Lawrence County, there were a number of black ministers who came to the area and preached Probably the most notable would be the Reverend Charles Bowles. And you can find this book about his life online. And I talk about him in my book. He was a veteran of the American Revolution. He served both in the Massachusetts and New Hampshire uh, Continental Armies. Um, and he went on to become a Free Will Baptist minister. And the Free Will Baptists were some of the most radical abolitionists in the area. Their congregations, which centered out of New Hampshire, were among the first to outlaw segregation in the seating in their uh, sanctuaries. And in 1838, 
they urged all of their members to take an oath against slavery and to do all they could to lobby for the end of the evil of slavery. And they added a piece to the liturgy where a weekly prayer in their services for the end of the, of the slavery. Well, Reverend Bowles came here as an old man after his son, who was often also a minister, had come to the area. He came here to retire. But when he got here, enough of his old parishioners were living in the area that they begged him to start preaching. So he again picked up the clause of the Free Will Baptist Church, and um, he went on to found a number of churches in the area. It's interesting He's described as a very tall man, and at the time he was here, he was gradually going blind. And one of the things that impressed people was that he could be asked to, to recite a chapter and verse from the Bible by number, and he knew them. He'd memorized, supposedly, the entire text of the Bible. Uh, the, the Free Will Baptist Church was a very important in the area. They were the most radical abolitionists. And people like the McEwens from the town of Lawrence were among uh, active in, um, underground railroad operators. And everywhere in the county that you saw Free Will Baptist, you also saw lots of abolitionist activity. Um, okay, next. In 1846, Garrett Smith, the noted abolitionist philanthropist and land baron, gave 50-acre parcels of land to two free black men from every county in the state so they could vote. In St. Lawrence County, John King and Flora Fry of Governor were selected. Flora Fry used the money from her land to, to purchase a house in Governor. Her family would go on to live there for two generations. And I really had to look at her story because I mean, this land was being given to men so they could vote because in New York State had a property ownership requirement for black men only after the 1820s to vote. It was basically a, a poll tax. Uh, and it turns out that Flora Fry was born Flora Buck in the town of Champion, about where West Carthage is, and her father, uh, Benjamin Buck, ran the ferry across the Black River at that point. Um, she went on to live in Philadelphia and at several other towns in Jefferson County with her husband, Danby. When he died in 1839, she moved to Governor, where she raised her children. Uh, None of her children were literate, which was not uncommon because in New York state law at the time only said that school board members may provide education to black students. They didn't have to provide education to black students. Next slide. Okay. Her son, Danby Fry Jr. grew up. He was a baby when they moved to Governor and she, he lived there with his mother and his sisters in Governor up until 1863. And it's an interesting story to uncover. The new, new governor of New York State elected in 1863 was a Democrat who was opposed to the Civil War. And after the Emancipation Proclamation, each Northern state was allowed to raise black regiments, but the governor had to do that. Our governor refused to do it, he said, that he said that there wasn't any need for more soldiers. They already had enough. Meanwhile, when they were issuing lots of draft calls for white soldiers, uh, eventually they got, us, got him to sign a paper in October of 1863 saying he wasn't going to raise a regiment. And then the federal government raised the first New York State regiment uh, without the assistance of the governor of New York. And Danby Fry, was so enthusiastic. He traveled from Governor to New York City in order to register in New York State's first black regiment. And he actually enlisted two days before the regiment was 
um, legally constituted. He served faithfully in the war, was honorably discharged, and after the war, he lived in Auburn, New York, where he died in the 1880s. At the end of his service in the war, he was confined to a hospital for three months. Um, and when he died, the doctor in Auburn said it was from things exposed in the war. His widow applied for a pension, and she was denied on the grounds that there was no diagnosis in his hospital records during the Civil War, so they couldn't prove that what he died from uh, had anything to do with his service, despite the local doctor in Auburn saying it did. Next slide. Now, this is <clears throat> something I found in looking through records was pretty amazing. Uh, the North, as we all know, won the Civil War, and there were a number of constitutional amendments passed abolishing slavery and granting citizenships and political rights to free Black people. And then it wasn't until these amendments were passed that Black men in New York State got to vote without having to own property. And this seemed like it should be a great time for the Black population in St. Lawrence County. It did augur a big change. Before the Civil War, all of the Black residents of St. Lawrence County were born in New England or New York or Pennsylvania or Canada. There were none uh, listed as being from the Southern states. And after, this, after the Civil War, um, most of the influx of, of new people was from the southern states, newly newly freed people from the south. But in fact, what happened in St. Lawrence County, you see, is a deepening racism took place and that you see the county start to accept the Jim Crow, Crow rules of the south, um, <clears throat> including, uh, if you look at the newspapers online, you used to be able to do an easy um, uh, statistical search, and you find that before 1860, the N word appeared less than 50 times. Between 1860 and 1900, the N word is used over 2,000 times. And often it's in these serialized stories that the local newspapers carry that depicted black people as ignorant, speaking pig pigeon English, not being worthy of really being second-class human beings. And they ran multiple serialized stories about this. Okay, next slide. Now, one of the groups that came from following the Civil War uh, were the camp followers. These were black people who went upon being liberated by the Union Army, chose to follow the Union Army and provide services to the soldiers, such as washing clothes, chopping firewood, shaving and cutting hair, uh, anything they could do, and in exchange for which they made sustenance to survive. Uh, and I was told that uh, one, one particular regiment, the brought back six, six slaves, as I was told about 20 years ago. And I was able to identify two of them who came to DeKalb. Um, in the middle of this picture, which I showed at the beginning, you'll see a black man standing. His name is Charlie Clark. And he came back to St. Lawrence County when he was 16 with uh, Gilbert Merrithew from DeKalb. Gilbert, um, and he arrived in Ogdensburg on that day. We know from town records the day that, that Gilbert was locally discharged at the train station in Ogdensburg, and Charlie was with him. Um, and Walker Tompkins of Canton was another person. He, I'm not sure of which group he came back with, but uh, he also came back. Charlie continued to live in the town of DeKalb and worked on farms as long as he was physically able. Uh, by the time I, when I started this research, there were people still alive in the town that remembered Charlie. And it was a bit of shock to me to hear people say, oh yeah, I remember Charlie. He worked for 
this family, and he was considered so dirty, they made him sleep in the manger, in the dairy barn, and they brought his food to him on a plate. Uh, sort of like Jesus born in the manger. Uh, I can't imagine, I grew up on a dairy farm, and I can't imagine how anybody could stay that clean, sleeping in the manger of a dairy barn. Anyway, that way, and he, and in 1923, Charlie was is approaching 80 years old, and he was too ill to do any work anymore. And the person he was working for called the town poor officer, and they took him to the poorhouse in Canton. And he died there a couple of years later. Um, he's buried in Gilbert Marathew's family plot in um, Richville. Can we uh, turn to the next page? Okay. I just want to mention before going with this slide, Walker Tompkins came to Morley at the end of the Civil War. And unlike some of the others in Morley, Walker was enrolled in school and educated and was able to read and write. He took part in lo local plays. Eventually, um, according to legend, some of the boys in in uh, Morley took him to Norfolk because there was a young black woman there who he courted and married. And they raised two children in Morley. And as adults, they moved to Canton. And one of their sons became Jake the Barber, who is sort of famous in Canton and continued to live there until the 1950s. Um, one of the most notable uh, black citizens of St. Lawrence County was uh, George, George B. Swan, who came to Potsdam about 1855. He was a master sash and door maker, as his father was back in Massachusetts. He was born a free man in Western Massachusetts. He eventually owned the sash and door works. And the land where Swan's Landing today is named for him. <clears throat> His factory at various years employed between 50 and 100 people. He was elected a Potsdam Village trustee in 1862. And that election was noted not in the local papers, but in a Boston abolitionist paper. Um, he would go on to be, uh, besides being a trustee, he was a commissioner of public works. He was noted for the fact that when any of his employees were drafted during the Civil War, he provided food and other sustenance for all of their families. So he was quite a benevolent individual. Um, he was active in the local and county and state Republican Party. When he died in 1884, every business in Potsdam closed for his funeral. A letter of condolence was published in the New York Daily Times by the state Republican Party. He here was a very prominent black man, and you find lots about him in regional and local papers up until his death, including coverage of his funeral. But once he died, they never mentioned him again. His role was not one that they wanted to perpetuate in local media. Next. Okay, on the other hand, Edward Green, who was a contemporary, Edward Green came to St. Lawrence County as an apprentice minister, which is one of the ways they trained ministers in the 19th century to go, they go work with another minister and learn how to make sermons, etc. He came to the county as an apprentice minister. He lived in DeKalb. He was married to a French-Canadian white woman. Um, she died. She became ill, and his daughter became ill. He owed the doctor in DeKalb, uh, uh, Dr. Green, uh, Dr. Miller, rather, uh, the bill for his for his taking care of his wife and her final illness and green uh, miller dr miller came to him and said there was a gentleman who had died in the town who suffered from some kind of congenital bone defor deformity his name was potter rice 
and he had died. Um, the doctor wanted to do an autopsy on him, and somehow he didn't ask the family or whatever. He went to Edward Green to help and said, I'll forgive your bill if you help me dig up Potter Rice. And um, so Edward Green did it. And then he felt guilty and went and told people what he'd done and that he was sorry. And they immediately went to Dr. Miller's house and they found Dr. Miller boiling the bones of Potter Rice to remove the flesh on his stove. Now, um, they were both arrested and taken to the county jail and the St. Lawrence County Medical Association immediately bailed out Dr. Miller who fled to Canada where he was from and Edward Green was was immediately convicted of grave robbing and sent to the penitentiary for six months. And this is an article from 1867. And you'll see that local people, as I said, when Dr. Miller came back finally in the summer of 1867, he was given a hundred dollar fine. Meanwhile, his accomplice who was paid paying off a medical bill by helping him disinter the body, spent six months in jail. And as the editor of the paper said, that being that the doctor's sentence was justice, was just, then Evergreen should never serve time. Now, this is a sad story. And Evergreen went on to have what was not a laudable life. He got into trouble. His second wife died. He remarried again each time. He married three different French Canadian white men, white women, which probably means he was fluent in French. But anyway, he was eventually murdered uh, while fishing on the banks of the St. Lawrence in uh, Ogdensburg on what's today the state hospital grounds. He, um, following his murder, there was a trial, and in the end, his character was put on on the on the bench rather than the murderers, and the murderer was let go free basically because Edward Green was a bad man and he'd been killed with a hatchet because he was fishing on the banks of the river by this guy's family farm. Um, afterwards, that would be a sad enough story, but starting around 1906 the local papers started to retell this story over and over again. About every five years, they tell the story. And every time they told it, Edward Green was more notorious. At one point, they said he had superhuman strength. He was able to swim in the river below the power dam in Hewleton against the current and swim up to the dam. He was so strong. And he was said to steal from the rich, to give to the poor, and the legend just got bigger, but it was all this picture of the evil black man. And the last time it was retold was in 1947 in a camp newspaper. And I counted 27 different times his story was retold in this time period when nobody retold um, a Mr. Swan's story. Next. Okay, now we get into the modern era that I call the industrial era in chapter five in my book. And up until 1900, the black population in St. Lawrence County was scattered pretty much around the county. You'd some, find some black men working in the lumber woods. You'd find people working on farms. At one point, there were six black men in 1860, I believe, working in a potato starch factory in Madrid. Wherever there was work, you would find the population. But by night, after 1900, they started to concentrate in two places, Ogdensburg and Messina. Messina, however, in 1915, at the time of the state census, there were only five black people in the village of Messina. There were two women and three men. Uh, however, in August of that year, there was a major strike when more than 2,000 of the employees at, at Alcoa went on strike and the National Guard were called in to bring down, to, to break up the strike. The workers went on strike here because they 
discovered that Alcoa workers in Niagara Falls were getting two twenty-five per day for work, and in Messina they're only getting a dollar sixty-five. Um, in response to this strike, which was broken up using uh, the National Guard, as I said, Alcoa began to implement what they called the Frick system of labor management, and they began to recruit black workers. The idea being you have disparate workers, they won't bond together and join the same union. So by bringing in black workers, they were trying to keep the Alcoa plant from unionizing. Okay, next slide. Um, Alcoa was sort of a benevolent employer. They even had a, a pasteurized milk station that they built for their employees so they would have safe milk to drink. The Alcoa plant by 1919 and Messina was the largest aluminum smelting plant in the world. Uh, after they started um, recruiting black employees, they purchased the Lincoln Hotel, which was specifically for black employees to live in. They also had three other hotels that they built as rooming houses, basically, for black for employees. And I found from the census data, even though this was the black, black dorm, so-called, there were black employees in every other one of the, uh, Alcoa's rooming houses. And also, black families moved to Messina in large numbers. And any every black family on the 1920 census had at least one or two non-family member black men boarding in their houses. So, and as the community grew, a section of, of Alcoa along the Power Canal and the next street over what's today Jefferson Street and Liberty Avenue became known as the colored section of town because there were that many people, black people living there. Uh, after they built it, Alcoa started, they had a clubhouse for their other employees. They set up a separate club room for uh, their black employees. They also um, had, had one of their employees who was a minister started a colored church, which was held in various buildings, starting with the fiber factory at Alcoa and then moving to the Pine Grove settlement. So they encouraged and set up colored settlements, um, colored church, colored social events. They sponsored um, different um, black musical groups. If you go to the Chicago Defender, the, they list about two dozen different traveling like black jazz and other entertainment groups all passing through Messina as an entertainment, we assume, for their employees. Next. <clears throat> um, one of the first workers to come to Alcoa was Curtis Sneed. Um, he was hired in the December of 1915. We know this from his draft record. He was among the first draftees from Messina to be called up when the U.S. entered World War I. And he served honorably in, and was awarded the French Croix de Guerre for his service. Uh, he came back after the war. They put his picture in the aluminum bolts in the Alcoa newsletter with his medals. And um, he continued to work there for a number of, of years after his military service. And he was one of a number of black employees who were enlisted in the draft and from Messina. Okay, next. Okay, here's some examples of some of the entertainment that was going on in Messina, the African American entertainment. You've noticed this is the one on the right is from the aluminum bolt and includes a nice picture and a write up of it. And it shows that some of the entertainers at this night were Alcoa employees and others were bl black professionals who were traveling through town. And this is one of the few events that also received an advertisement in the Messina newspaper of 
what was going on in the black community. Okay. Okay, next, yeah. Um, Alcoa had baseball leagues and they had their own black baseball team. Um, they, 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 one of their employees was a former Negro League professional ball player, according to local records. And he took the colored giants on tours around towns in St. Lawrence County and playing demonstration games against the local team. And from the accounts, it seems as though they were sort of like the Harlem Globetrotters. They said that whenever local people would complain because one of the black players was too good, they'd pull the, he, the manager would pull them from the field. And so that the local team always beat the color giants. Next. The manager was A.L. Ellerby, and he also ran two rooming houses as well as working at uh, the um, Alcoa Mill. And one of his rooming houses I show in this picture it still stands today. It's abandoned, but it was in the colored section of Messina. And here's an ad from the local newspaper for a while. He ran a colored orchestra and they were teaching dancing um, as well. So some of the other cultural things there. Okay, next. Okay. Uh, by 1918, uh, the aluminum bulletin announced that Mrs. Ellie Hobson of Chase Street in Messina had become the local reporter for the Chicago Defender and she was selling subscriptions. The Defender at this time was the largest black newspaper in the country. And in the Defender is where we really find what was going on in Messina with the black community. This article, which I'm sure is not legible, talks about a raid on a jazz club in Pool Hall, black owned, and the owner, who was, by the way, was a register, register for the draft in Messina. Uh, they were close on claiming they were selling booze illegally because uh, Messina was dry at this time. And uh, they, they accused, as they did over and over again in Messina, every black woman was accused of being a prostitute. Um, and in response, okay, thank you. And in this paper, they talk about Judge Childs Chase, who I found through the newspapers I followed, but this was the nail in the coffin for Judge Chase. Um, he was a judge from 1904 until he was defeated in 1927. The defender quotes him in sentencing the Holmes from the previous article, you may be a smart end, but we don't want any ends in this town anyway. I'm going to fix you so you never do business in this state. And what he did repeatedly over 20 years in the newspapers, there's a black person who appeared before him, whatever they did, unless, and we'll get to this in a minute, unless they had a jury trial, which didn't happen and there were no public defenders, he they would sentence them to banishment from the community or a sentence in the county jail and overwhelmingly sent people away. The article in the Defender also mentions one an incident that happened in um, Messina that's not mentioned in local papers in which they broke up a craps game in one of the rooming houses and arrested all the black, 14 black men for, for gambling. And they were all sentenced to leave town immediately or go to jail. Next. Um, an official complaint, according to the defender, was of misconduct was filed with Governor Whitman in 1918. I contacted the state archives and they could find no records of any action being taken or any follow up being taken for this. It would take until 1927 when the town finally got fed up with Judge Chase and voted him out of office. But by that time, he had managed to uh, 
eliminate most of the hundreds of black workers in Messina. Um, he would continue to banish people for years. And single bl black women were especially vulnerable. In one case in May, 1923, Chase dealt with three women who were charged. So, And the way he got these people charged usually was they would get have white men who were arrested for public intoxication or having booze, which was illegal during the prohibition. And then he would do a plea deal. They would have no charges if they would finger the black prostitutes. And so in this case, three women were charged. Uh, each was fined $50 and told to be on the next train out of town or spend three months in jail. What would you do? There were two other black women who were only, who were renting rooms in the house and they were charged with renting rooms in a disorderly house and were ordered to be on the 610 train that day or else. Next. Okay, and now comes Lovick and Maggie White were the managers of the Lincoln Hotel that I mentioned before. Officers raid, raided the hotel in August of 1923. They found black people attending a party, searching the premises. They uncovered three and three quarters quarts of Jim Crow, a half pint of whiskey, and a quart and a half of alcohol. Uh, Lovick White was immediately sent to the federal jail in Utica. And Maggie White, they waited a few days and they and they then accused Maggie of have running a house of prostitution. Maggie White, as shows from the trial's records, had gone to Tennessee because she was sick. She would hire local women to do the laundry, to cook, etc. And there was a constant turnover. They didn't like to work there, or they found better jobs, whatever. So she went south and found a group of black women to come and live in the hotel and do that work that uh, she couldn't find reliable people locally for. Um, Maggie White is really the hero to me of the story of Messina and the black community. She is the first person who had the audacity to ask for a jury trial. And you know what happened? The district attorney dropped all charges because there was no evidence to support the charges. Maggie would go on to be harassed by the judge for many years and finally banished from by him in 1927. Next. Okay. Here's an example. There were lots of black workers. Here's another picture from the aluminum bulletin. We see this gentleman, black man, was a Alcoa employee who was on the safety committee. And he got his picture here because he wore safety glasses and his glasses were splattered with aluminum. So anyway, next. And then uh, in, in, nine, in the late, around 1927, the Ku Klux Klan, which had been active in the west part of the town of the county, started to become active in Messina and Potsdam area. And this is the town hall in Messina. And there were Klan rallies held in the town hall in 1927. And uh, the New York State Grand Dragon, C.B. Smith, sp held a rally in this building. And uh, both the uh, Potsdam Clavern 2A and, and the Messina Power City Clavern 212 were chartered in 1927. <clears throat> there were at least 10 KKK rallies known to have been held in Potsdam and Messina, and a cross was burnt behind Kaufman's store on Main Street in Messina. Next. <clears throat> the Messina clan had their headquarters at this 124 Maple Street building. And the Klan was still active in Messina as late as 1934. And they had public demonstrations at one point because the village or town uh, hired black workers to dig a canal for, I believe, water pipes. Next. Um, 
there were families in Messina, and I was under, under able to uncover some of them. Rudolph Valentino Sims was the last black baby I was able to find born in Messina. He was born July 3rd, 1926. And he went on to attend NYU and was a champion cross country runner. And here he is winning a race in their, their yearbook in 1942. Um, in the spring of 1928, Alcoa offered the Black Lincoln Hotel for sale. They were no longer recruiting any or hiring black workers. And in 1925, there've been almost 50 black workers still working in Messina. In 1930, there were four. The, the, the campaign within the community to rid itself of, the, of its black citizens had taken effect. Only one of the men who was recruited in those 10 years of recruitment at Alcoa stayed there for the rest of his life. And that was because he was disabled in an accident in the mill and lived on disability and had no family. He was uh, from um, an island in the Atlantic and had no family in the area or in the United States at all. So he stayed in Messina, he's the only one. Next. And Manuel Barros, who I was speaking of, was from the Cape Verde Islands. And he was in the poorhouse in 1950. Oops, can we go back for a minute? Yes. Um, and in, by 1950, he was in the county poorhouse, but he died in 1957 in Messina and is buried there. And he's the only black worker out of all the hundreds who worked there who, who ended up staying in Messina. Finally, okay, uh, I found this quote very telling by Mary Church Terrell in the Chicago Defender, and she was talking about the blood libel incident in Messina, which happened in 1928. Um, and I think this is really telling and looking at what happened in Messina and the difference between what happened to the Jewish community and the black community. People who are filled with prejudice against others who differ from them either in race or religion have no judgment at all. They believe anything they hear about victims of their hatred and contempt. The actions taken by the Jews in Messina, New York, is a good example for every malign group to follow. He was probably the most prominent black female suffragette in the United States at that time. Um, this would have been equivalent of having Martin Luther King comment perhaps on something that was going on um, in St. Lawrence County, okay? Oh, I think Brian has, uh, are you there? <laughs> There you yes. are. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, Brian, thank you so much for uh, for such a remarkable book and and um, such great detail. Um, it's uh, it you bring the story alive in a way that just the uh, the words in your book. Um, you know, I think hearing you uh, tell these stories is is incredibly important, and I I wanted to. We uh, we have a little bit of time left, and we have some questions already from the audience. But I, I think it's important after learning about this history to understand the catalyst for your work. What were the very personal reasons you had for for setting out on this research in the first place? Um, I'm adoptive parent of two black children who I raised here, and um, it, the real catalyst was. When I went to a parent-teacher conference to my son's fourth grade teacher where they're supposed to learn local history, I talked to him and asked if he'd learned anything about black people locally, uh, which could include all of Northern New York. And he um, said, no. So I asked the teacher at the conference and she said to me, oh, he was sick on the one day we talked about black history. And I knew that black people had to have been here 
a lot more than one day. They were here a lot of time, but I didn't realize until I started digging it that they've always been here since the beginning of non-Aboriginal settlement in the area, that there's constantly been Black people here. So, you know, we're talking two, more than 250 years. What do you think is the cost of not knowing this history? I think we um, can repeat serious mistakes. You know, one of the things we need to do is learn from history. And we have lost an understanding of our richness. And I just think, like in Messina, I could just see the cultural things that were going on in the Black community when it was there that we all could have benefited from if it had continued. I, I want to get to uh, to some of the questions that have uh, come in through the Q&A, but I guess I, I'm leading into that. Um, you know, at one level, obviously, it, it seems absurd that a school would have only devoted one day to uh, to 300 years of black history in St. Lawrence County uh, and that you wouldn't have already known the story of Charlie Clark. Um, but then again, your book didn't yet exist. So right. without a lot of detailed histories to draw from, how did you go about doing this research over the over the 20 years that it came together? Okay, well, and my whole purpose in writing the book was so that teachers would have background. So they, I don't expect them to use the book in the classroom, but they can read it and have the information. Um, I dug in very many different places and one clue might lead to another. Like I presented a, a talk at the National Parks uh, conference on the Underground Railroad in Niagara Falls a few years ago and talked about the abolitionists in St. Lawrence County. Sitting at a luncheon, I sat next to a librarian from Buffalo, and we started talking about sources and things. And, of course, the Ogdens, who own big tracts of land here, also own land of western New York and Buffalo. And she said, oh, we have some Ogden records here. But if you really want to see Ogden papers, you need to go to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. They have the largest collection. And then when I looked at those, I discovered that not only did they have the Ogden papers, they also had a huge section of the papers of the Hasbrook family from Ogdensburg, the first county clerk who I had seen in the Ogdensburg Public Library, their bills of sale for slaves well, it turned out they had half the correspondence between Hasbrook and himself. So one, the letter from early October would be in Augsburg, and the letter from late October was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And without going to Ann Arbor, Michigan, you wouldn't get the whole story. Um, and that was an incredible story. I didn't really touch much on it here today, but that was an incredible story, the story of Nanny. And that's just one example. I was doing some other research at, with a, a distance league from the American Antiquarian Society, and I started looking through their newspaper index. And I discovered they had the only copy known to exist of the laborer from Governor, which was the first anti-slavery newspaper published in St. Lawrence County. Huh. Um, you know, Frederick Douglass's newspaper had clues uh, I the Albany in Albany, the state archives had information for me, and the New York City Historical Society had archives. I spent three days in Ulster County trying to do research and about the backgrounds of the enslaved people I knew from who came from there. Um, so I went many places and I find a clue, and then someone would point me in another direction. Um, and usually I only got a few words in one source, but it would help build the story. And the whole story of what went on in Messina totally changed for me, for me when I discovered the Chicago Defender had articles about what was going on there. And you could get a hint of what was going on, but the Chicago Defender was blatant about the racism that was going on with the black community. 
Uh, I, I'm going to get to uh, some questions here from uh, the many people who are in the audience. Uh, Anthony would like to know, uh, he says, I think we all assume that blacks living in the Adirondacks and in the region migrated there from uh, a southern trajectory north. I, I know one of the things you write about is there were also many who came over from New England. Um, yep. But is there any evidence that some came from the north uh, in Canada, south yeah. into the region? Oh, yeah, definitely. Edward Green, who the notorious murder of Edward Green, was born in Canada and came over to this side of the border. And yet his census records show his parents were born in Virginia. So there's probably a story that we'll never know, but I, his, his parents may have escaped from slavery to the free community in Canada where he was born. And then he came back into the States. And he's just one example. There were, um, well, the Boston family, uh, I'm forgetting her name now, but Mrs. Boston was born in Cornwall. She was baptized in the Episcopal Church in Cornwall. So there was the border was fluid. People moved back and forth all the time. And I think that actually uh, that might answer Anthony's other question about uh, slaves that escaped to uh, to Canada via the uh, the Underground Railroad. Uh, whether there's evidence that that's how they got there, it certainly seems that there were there were some that uh, that came through the Hello? region. And oh, are you still there? I think you've frozen. Oh, now you're back. Okay. Yeah. Um. Peter would like to know, did you find any early evidence of black residents of southeastern St. Lawrence County, such as in the Piercefield area? Um, I actually didn't, but that area was mostly settled later than the rest of the county. Um, so the records are different. Well, I do include in the book at the back, I include all of the census records for St. Lawrence County, the abstract data each town and how many black people live there every five years because i use new york state and federal censuses so if someone wants to research that for their town they can see when black people moved in and out um, I'm curious, you know, one of our, our previous events with Amy Godin uh, covered some adjacent ground to what you write about. How do you see your research and the book that resulted from it uh, relating in comparison to The Black Woods, which was her book? Well, I think my book shows that Black people, as I said, Black people have been here since the very first incursion of Europeans to this area. In Amy's book, they're really looking at the uh, abolitionist era when Garrett Smith gave the land. And I know also from some of the war records, there were Black people in the Plattsburgh area as well, very early on. Some of them served in the War of 1812. Um Heather would like to know, was St. Lawrence County impacted by the 1850 fugitive slave law? Uh, was the law feared by the free black communities in our area? My understanding is, and this is anecdotal, that many of uh, when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, many black men who were the most valuable to kidnap went to Canada. And then after a period, usually just a few months, they came back. But the Fugitive Slave Act was the domino that knocked St. Lawrence County into being overwhelmingly abolitionist before that act was passed and that was so blatantly unfair. Um, there, were, there was a minority of people who opposed slavery here, actively opposed slavery. But the act was so blatant when it, the judge who decided whether someone was a fugitive or not was paid twice as much if he decided the person was a fugitive as if he decided the person was not a fugitive. And the fugitives were not allowed to present a defense. They were not allowed to have an attorney when they went to court or anything. And it was just so blatant that people that have been on the fence in Northern New York, not wanting to get involved, became involved in opposition to slavery. It was a major turning point. 
Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, Carol comments that uh, she's surprised that the KKK was active as active as it was in northern New York State. Uh, she always thought of it as a southern problem. Uh, was that at all a surprise to you when uh, when you discovered uh, so much of the KKK activity in this region? Uh, a little bit, but I knew from previous history lessons that the, the, the second KKK that started after the birth of a nation was more active in the North, in the Midwest, than the original one was. So it wasn't a total surprise, but the extent, and it's, it's very easy to find. In my book, I have a chart that shows how many rallies are listed, and those are all listed from local papers. And there were certainly other events that happened involving the KKK that weren't documented in the newspapers. Let me ask a delicate question, and I hope you don't mind. Um, did you have any qualms about being a white person doing this work and writing this book? Yes, I did. And I sort of, after I started doing research, I, um, I kept saying, I'm not the right person to do this. You know, so uh, a black person should do this. And finally, um, a black friend of mine who I had talked about and said that to, said to me that I was the only person that could do this because I am a lifetime resident. My family has been here since 1802, you know. And so that's when I, did, I really dedicated myself to making sure this happened. Uh, we have we have two more open questions in the Q and A. Uh, actually, one of them is just a comment. Marty says, uh, "No question, just thankful for the presentation. Very well done. Appreciate the anecdotes and individual stories." Uh, so I thought you should hear that. Uh, and then Anthony has a follow up question: What does the census data of today show regarding the population of African Americans in St. Lawrence County? Uh, is it increasing or decreasing these days? It's it's hard to tell because now we have a prison population that we never had before. And um, it's hard to figure out the, from the raw data and they don't release the actual census for 75 years. So it's hard. I do know that after 1950, it was hard to find data because in response to the Civil Rights Act, Congress mandated that they lump black people in with all other minorities in 1960. So it's hard to bear, like Native Americans and black people and whatever, were all lumped together. And it was a way to, they saw what people were doing with the statistics and they wanted them not to be available. So in 1960, they're not. And after that, it's more difficult to tell from census data. And if it wasn't for census data, as Amy Godine said, you wouldn't even know a lot of these people existed. The Fry family and Governor, if it wasn't for deeds, Garrett Smith's records, and the census, I wouldn't have known. They were ever there. They're never mentioned in the local newspapers. They don't appear in church records anywhere. Uh I have one more question before we uh, wrap up. Uh, 20 years is a long time to do anything, but with work that's so so as important as this, how has going through this process over two decades affected you? Uh, how has it affected me? I, I get very emotional about some of these stories sometimes. I'm really personally involved, but I also, now feel like you've got to look deep. There's all a lot of stories there that aren't being told. And so you take a second look at everything in history and whatever, you know, there's a lot of stories out there we need to hear. Well, we have a number of people in the uh, chat and the Q&A who, uh, who wanted to say thank you. Uh, I guess one last uh, one last question before we wrap up. Robin would like to know, where is the book available? <laughs> <laughs> it's available at the Brewer Bookstore, I know for sure. And that's and in Canton for folks who don't know. Canton, and it's available at the St. Lawrence County Historical Association in their gift shop, the Augsburg Museum. It is published by History Press, which is part of Arcadia. And any place that carries those books could carry it. 
And if they don't have it, ask them to get it because it ha- we need more people to pick it up. I want people to read this book. And if folks aren't paying close attention to the chat, Annabelle has just pasted in the uh, link to uh, to buy the book through the ADKX store. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I should have mentioned they have. It. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, well, Brian Thompson, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your research, for spending some time with us this evening, and uh, best of luck with your work. Thank you. And uh, I'll turn things back over to uh, to Joe at the Adirondack Experience. Yes, thank you, Brian and Mitch. Uh, great to have you both here again. Um, we hope to see everyone next month. Uh, next month, we have Daniel Way. He's going to be talking about his book, Seneca Ray Stoddard, An Intimate Portrait of an Adirondack Legend. Um, so for more information, you can go to the adkx.org slash events. Um, we've got lots going on here at the Adirondack Experience. Uh, Winter Fun Day is coming up next week as well as the Adirondack Avian Walk. So um, all of the information, again, is on our website. Annabelle is posting those links in the chat. Um, and we're also having a special Zoom series for the upcoming eclipse on April 8th. So it's going to be astronomy-themed, variety of different topics, and speakers about the eclipse. So for all of us at Adirondack Experience, have a great night, and we'll see you next week or next month. <laughs>